Welcome to the American Institute of Healthcare Professionals videogram on counseling issues in divorce and remarriage within the church. And this video correlates with our spiritual counseling 570 program. So it's very important to, uh, as a counselor, to sometimes deal with Christians who unfortunately have had the mishap of divorce occur in their lives. And it is a serious pastoral concern for these individuals who wish for their marriage to have lasted, but it was ruined maybe due to infidelity or drugs, and they are no longer considered married, and many face a stigma within some parishes or churches, depending on their rules, of being a divorced Christian, especially when there's so much emphasis placed on Christian marriage itself. And Christian marriage is an elevation of the natural order of a union between a man and a woman. And I emphasize a man and a woman because within Christianity, a sacrament is only uh, valid between a man and a woman, because in Genesis, Adam and Eve, man and woman, they were created. So a valid union in the eyes of God can only be between a man and woman, despite modern culture and its new ideas on unions. Uh, in terms of state union, obviously, there can be a variety of different types of contracts between individuals, even homosexuals and those types of unions. But within Christianity, the union must be between a man and a woman. And in doing so, it was elevated from the Old Testament, as found in Genesis, to something with more value when Christ acknowledged it and instituted it as within some Christianity uh, churches as a sacrament a sacrament in that he endorsed it, he approved it. At the miracle feast of Cana, he turned water into wine at the request of his mother. And Christ instituted this, and he emphasized it throughout the, the Gospels about how it is an unbreakable union, an unbreakable vow. And he rebuked many within the, the Jewish tradition who had said Moses permitted us to remarry, and Christ responded that it's only because you were so stubborn that it was permitted. But he told them that it is instead a reality that what God has put together, let no man put asunder. That even if one looks at another or thinks about being with another, they have committed adultery in their mind. So he took it a step further than even what many of those taught within the Mosaic law regarding adultery and the unbreakable, the unbreakable level of the sacrament, of the actual vow itself, that a man and a woman come together and they stay together, that a man will leave his mother and take upon a bride. So Christ was very, very steadfast in saying that it was unbreakable, that it was a permanent bond that could not be broken in itself. Uh, St. Paul in his epistles also illustrates the beauty of Christian marriage, uh, comparing it to Christ and his church on how uh, Christ so loved his church that he'd be willing to die for it. And that's how a husband is with his wife. He so loves his wife that he should be willing to die for her. And like the church, the wife obeys her husband as church obeys Christ. Now, obviously, many uh, patriarchal misogynists can come about with that, making the wife subdue to the woman. But if taken in its proper understanding, especially how Christ showed that the love of a husband is so great, then we can see that there is an a imbalance or a superiority, so to speak, but a, a communion with each other, working towards a common goal in itself.
So the Pauline illustrations show a very beautiful union, uh, an unbreakable union. Now there is an exception clause which divides many Christians. Uh, it is found in the book of Matthew where Christ during that same dialogue with the Jewish authorities said, unless lewd conduct uh, occurs, then this may break a particular union. And many scholars argue that, well, this means that there is a pretense for possible divorce, while others within Christianity say, well, this is the book of Matthew. It's only mentioned in Matthew, and th therefore it must be addressing a particular Jewish situation and should not be applied universally. So within the Catholic tradition, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, the exception clause is not seen as a clause for divorce, but within many Protestant denominations and some Orthodox, uh, it is seen as a reason for so. So it basically depends what tradition you come from in regards for the exception clause itself. Now, unfortunately, regardless, with the best intentions, Christian marriage and all of its sacramental beauty, its mystique, its elevation by Christ, the most beautiful vow between Christ and his church being compared to, divorce still occurs because we're human beings, because we're broken. And it happens to many, many Christians. So as a pastoral counselor, as a Christian counselor, it's important to acknowledge that not necessarily it's their fault. Sometimes these things happen. Sin happens and that there shouldn't be a stigma placed upon the individual or that they are a bad Christian because divorce occurred. Because within divorce, not only is an individual dealing that is a Christian dealing with this stigma or this feeling that I failed my marriage, which is religious and before the eyes of God, but there's also the losses that go with it, the loss of the relationship primarily, but a multitude of secondary losses within itself, loss of a home, loss of maybe seeing their children as much, loss with custody battles, uh, not just over maybe a particular uh, child, but maybe uh, a pet. So there's an enormous amount of secondary losses that collide, forcing individuals to relocate, deal with civil cases of divorce, and financial strains that come with that. So there needs to be a lot of compassion shown to individuals who are going through divorce. Divorce is considered a very high stress meter life event and it can cause a lot of problems. So as a counselor, we're not just dealing with the spiritual element, but also all of these other uh, social issues and personal issues that come with losing a relationship in itself. With remarriage in Christianity, uh, again, there are multiple traditions uh, within Protestantism, remarriage is permitted if within the exception clause. Uh, some Protestant churches are more liberal in permitting remarriage, which to the point where it almost became, became an abuse, where if one could say there was infidelity, and then they can get out of the contract. And it was almost to the point where some individuals would purposely cause infidelity to justify uh, a breakup so that they could maybe remarry. And that was not the case so much in the Catholic and Orthodox situations. Uh, the Orthodox obviously closer related to Catholicism in preservation of the vow and not allowing a breakup of a marriage over other issues, but maintaining that it is a binding vow that does not permit remarriage in 99% of the situations and in Catholicism in 100% of the situations. Uh, in regards to a valid vow. And that's an important term, which we will return to in the next slide. Uh, but in terms of a valid vow, uh, there is really no instance in which remarriage could occur. And within Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, 
this created a issue, a pastoral issue with the church itself that led to blended families, as well as sacramental exclusion of many individuals. So as a Christian counselor, especially within the Catholic tradition, an individual who remarried was seen as living in sin because they took another wife. And that's coming from the Gospels, to married another. So in marrying another individual, the person was excluded from the Eucharist because they are considered to be living in sin. And they're not living with their wife or their husband. Instead, they're living with this new individual. In many cases, though, these individuals may have had other children, and these other children would come upon a stigma of being with a blended family. And uh, depending on the priest and knowing of the intimacy of the situations, some individuals would not be granted communion, and they would feel excluded, which could lead to a loss of faith. So they feel like they are a black sheep of the parish. Many would leave Catholicism, maybe enter into more lenient Protestant traditions even over these issues because they wish to remarry. And as Christian counselors, again, pastoral counselors, we have to look for the spiritual care of the individual and also weigh the law of Christ. So in The Joy of Love by Pope Francis, which is a recent publication by the pontiff. It deals with how do we address individuals who are divorced within the church, and how are they reincorporated? Obviously, if the other spouse that is divorced passed away, then reintegration would be easier. But what about these families who then are blended, but they have more children together, and those children have children. And now we have two generations of this couple together, but there are pastoral issues when it comes to attending church and things of that effect. And these are all difficult questions that I don't think can be answered. And I think they stem more with within Catholicism, what the local bishop might add, and also what the priest would advise the particular couple on how to handle this. Because again, there's a pastoral concern, but there's also weighing the words of Christ within this particular Catholic uh, situation in itself. Now, I did mention something very important for those of the Catholic faith, and those of not the Catholic faith bear with me, or also maybe get a, a stronger idea of what the Catholic Church teaches. But the big thing with the church is a valid sacrament or a valid vow, as I alluded to earlier. And what an annulment is, is a issuance by the church that invalidates the vow itself. It, it is based off of a pre-existing condition an a priori condition, which in some way makes the vow not complete. So when we look at a vow before God, an individual has to have complete freedom of conscience, free will, and no external barriers preventing them from moving forward. They also have full knowledge of what they're entering into. So as an individual enters into a vow before God, it's a very sacred thing. Now, with marriage, it's very difficult because you're not dealing just with God. God is overseeing it, but the administration of the sacrament is to each other. And so there is trust that there is fidelity, that you are marrying who you know. However, throughout the history of the church, there have been cases where individuals maybe were forced to marry. They weren't given complete freedom. Uh, there were individuals who uh, might have discovered later that a person was not open to having children and lied. Uh, there were situations where a person might have deceived who they were. So with all of these issues, coercion as well, an individual 
has to be able to make a vow in a right mind. And if for whatever reason, later down the road, a year or two down the road, it is discovered that these things pop up, you can, a Catholic can then appeal to the church through the tri local diocesan tribunal for an annulment. An annulment means the sacrament did not have the necessary conditions to fulfill the particular vow, and it invalidates it as if no marriage occurred at all. And of course, this is a messy situation, but it is one that does bear some common sense. But it also is open, especially with human beings being involved, right for corruption. And there has been many cases of annulments trying to be bought in the past. There's also been many cases of individuals going to the tribunal and then to the the, the, to the higher board, which is usually in the archdiocese, trying to pay someone or someone not being granted it because it wasn't the proper fees were not collected. And of course, in simony, there is a heresy of buying religious things. So there is a donation that is attached to all annulments. And they refer to it as a donation because there are diocesan staff, secretaries, and cases, paperwork, mailings that need to be conducted, investigations where everyone is involved that know the couple that are looked at, and there's fees for that. Now, some individuals are unable to pay for this service, and they are only charged by what they can afford and things like that. So you had corruption where if someone did not pay the fees, an annulment was not granted, or vice versa, someone who paid the fees but paid extra, or because of their status, might have been given an annulment. So these issues could occur. I'm not saying they were universal, but they could occur, and that could create a problem now with many individuals who were not granted an annulment, and they just left the church because they felt it was nonsense because of it. And for those cradle Catholics who leave the faith, it's usually over an annulment. It's usually over not receiving an annulment that they leave the actual Catholic church itself. So an annulment is something that is very legal. It's judged by a church tribunal and then a higher archdiocesan tribunal. It's a thorough investigation. There is a donation fee with it, but it only involves pre-existing conditions. A priori. If it is a posteriori or after the fact, then an annulment would not be granted. Say, for instance, you're married 15 years and your husband or wife had just a simple misstep of infidelity in a weakened moment that would not be grounds to annul the vow because the vow was good, problem was afterwards. So within the Catholic faith, you would not be granted that. It has to be tied to a pre-existing condition. And within the history of the church, annulments play a huge role, especially in Great Britain, where uh, King Henry VIII married uh, a woman, uh, Catherine of Aragon, uh, and she was from Spain, and uh, Catherine could not bear any children, even though they tried. They tried and tried, and he could not receive a male heir, and because of this, he wished to have an annulment based on the fact that they were closely related, not to the point of brother or sister, but it was within some cousin level that they were granted a special permission to marry. And that's what the royal families did. They all intermarried uh, within close relations, cousin, second cousin. And so he needed a special permission, a dispensation, as they call it. And uh, when Catherine could no longer produce a male heir or, ch or children, he wanted to marry another person that he fell in love with. And he based it on the fact that, hey, you should never have granted me that dispensation. I want an annulment, a priori situation, which the church denied. 
and in many ways, rightfully so, based on the theology of it. So much that it enraged Henry VIII, and hence the birth of the Anglican Church. But with Henry, you can see how it went worse. He ended up remarrying over and over, beheading some of his wives even. And it led to great scandal, how he then began to play God for himself and misusing Christian marriage for his own nationalistic and his own personal needs. So that's just a little bit of history on an annulment really gone bad and how prominent they are within Catholic theology itself and the problems they play for Catholics who sometimes do not have it granted and also problems for Catholics who might have dealt with corruption regarding annulment, not having it granted based on financial means or an individual trying to buy the, the service itself and which they should not have done. So the big th thing is not so much about annulments, trying to get out, trying to see who can remarry and who cannot, but protecting the sacrament, protecting the beauty of the vow. And within Catholicism, there is a pre-cana in Catholic Catholicism itself where individuals meet for a while. And this is where we have the purpose of engagement within all of Christianity, where there is a, a promise to be made and a feeling of e each other uh, spiritually, where to see if you're equally spiritually yoked in your love of God and understanding and respect of a vow when you make that commitment to one another. In this generation, so many things are, if it's broke, you don't fix it, you replace it with that type of materialistic understanding that leads to more divorce. Divorce is almost seen in Hollywood as dating in itself, marriage. If you marry someone, that's equivalent to having a new girlfriend or boyfriend instead of a permanent partner in life. So there needs to be a strong understanding of the permanence of the marriage vow through a strong engagement. And to have a idea of the importance of family in this secular immoral society and how the family can be a Christian fortress against this and raise children through this vow as a, as a fruit of the union and understanding the roles of father, mother, husband, wife, and how it's not a patriarchal submission of a woman but a way where both can work together towards a common goal as equals towards a better Christian world and allowing the Trinitarian ideal of Father, Son, Holy Spirit to manifest through father, wife, mother, and child. So I think these are some important things to delve upon, to think about, and how individuals need to enter into marriage with more caution than they may and understanding the strong and powerful commitment that comes with marriage itself. And I think Christian counselors can play a big role in preparing as well as helping those who unfortunately may fall, fall into a divorce, which does and can occur. So we offered AIHCP, a Christian counseling certification in itself. The link is above. The email is info at AIHCP.org. And our phone is 330-652-7776. I'd like to thank you for listening today and have a good day.